One of the really great, amazing, and important things about culture and the different cultures that exist is that it allows us to learn about and have the potential to be exposed to different values, different belief systems, different motivations for existing in this world. Now imagine if one particular group of people that had you know, their culture decided that not only was their culture the best culture and the superior culture, but now they are going to go about actively expanding themselves and finding other cultures with the sole purpose of getting rid of them and forcing them into extermination so that their one culture can be the one that prospers and continues on. So that is in kind of a very broad nutshell, what they're talking about in episode three of Exterminate All the Brutes. So let's talk about it. So in episode three of Exterminate All the Brutes, which is aptly titled Killing at a Distance, um, it starts off by giving us a historical progression of war. And not necessarily war in and of itself, but through the use of weaponry in war, most specifically guns, um, and then kind of goes from there into other forms of munitions. And one of the things that it pointed out that I noticed was that something that Europeans did kind of, I'll say effectively, um, before Europe was a superpower and, you know, Europeans were just kind of out exploring the lands and coming across different kingdoms and, you know, empires, is that they really took the whole gun weaponry thing, kind of put that on their back as an industry and they industrialized it. And so wealthy people who had the money were able to invest in these different the innovations around how to make guns, you know, work more easily, work more quickly, be more effective at, you know, what they're used for. And so what other um, empires did, specifically as an example, the Mughal Empire in, um, in South Asia, which was a... Um, which was kind of, they ruled most of India and Pakistan in the 16th and 17th century, that, you know, when the Europeans kind of connected with them, they were like, oh, okay, cool. So these white people have really like leaned into guns. And so what we're gonna do, we're not gonna invest our own resources into the innovations and all that because they're doing that work. Let's just hire them or partner with them. So then we have a place to get our weapons um, because they saw the value in having them, but we don't have to invest in the the um, technology because they're already doing it. And so these kind of partnerships created some of the first multinational corporations, um, in particular what was mentioned in the documentary, the British East India and Dutch East India companies. Um, those are names that I've heard a lot, just kind of will pop up in various historical contexts. And so it was interesting to know that that was essentially when the Indian moguls hired the British and Dutch to supply them with weapons. And so now we have the beginning of kind of arms dealing. Um, and, you know, that is was interesting because whenever you would watch stories of the Europeans and then the Americans, because the Europeans who came over to the United States and kind of settled here and began to basically have that same behavior, but you know, on this continent, <clears throat> how they would oftentimes show up to these places where you had these thriving cultures and people living their lives where they were essentially outgunned because those people and the people that were living there, the natives, whether they were natives there or they had just been there longer, because there were some instances people were native to the land, but some instances people had just traveled there and made their homes there. They, you know, depending on how much they kind of got out into the world and visited other lands themselves, they may or may not have had the same type of weaponry as the Europeans did when they showed up. And so they were sometimes, they just had more, they had the ability to, you know, destroy and kill more people more quickly from a further distance. <clears throat> so with this title, Killing at a Distance, that became kind of a, a power move on the end of the Europeans. So they would show up and um, 
you know, it, they could immediately just attack and kill a lot of people. And once you see that, you begin to think, okay, I want to get out of this alive. Like people aren't just, you know, martyring themselves for the sake of, they want to live, they might have families, other people in other lands, they want to still continue to have relationships and grow old and all of that stuff. And so then you get into kind of some of the other things that they're talking about in this episode, which is in general, as it relates to when, when the Europeans would come and kind of take over these particular lands after they have, you know, shown up with violence and murder. And so it was very, it was interesting to kind of see that played out. That is typically in my experience, thinking about history, that's usually how I would think about it. Um, because in most of the history classes that I've taken, everything is centered around some type of war. So it's like you're learning about here's this thing that happened as a result of this war or because a war happened, now you have to change things here and everything was very war centered. And you know, that something that I had never even considered until just now, how a lot of what we learn in history, in schools, um, and specific, definitely on my experience growing up in the South and um, going to public schools, when we had to take history classes and history courses, the history was very war focused. And as someone who, you know, I understand, you know, that wars happen. And that's kind of as far as I can take it. But I, it's never been something that I've been particularly fascinated, fascinated by or interested in learning more about and digging deeper into. And so when I'm sitting in class and everything is like, okay, you have this war, which led here to that war. And then these things happen in between that war. Someone like me, I'm glazed over. I don't, what? I don't understand. I don't want to hear this. Um, this isn't particularly interesting. You know, I'm just here so I don't get fined and I need this class to graduate. And so that was something that really stuck with me about history. So when I start to have opportunities to engage with historical information in a different way, where the approach isn't the same way it was when I was in school, it's always very interesting to me how it can connect more. And I definitely think that that approach, there's a reason for that. Um, and it kind of pulls out a certain a certain personality type as someone who really leans into that um unless you're in a situation where you have a teacher who finds a way to make it more interesting and and finds a way to make it more relatable to just kind of all of us in, in our you know living in our existence but if you didn't and you mainly just had the here read these chapters take this test type of teacher then everything is very war specific so looking at when this kind of started I had to fight the urge to kind of be like, oh, I'm never going to talk about war again. But the context was very helpful because it's like, this helps to explain how European, how the European kind of superpower and the supremacy of Europeans, which became white supremacy, um, how that all happened and how they're, and, you know, it was just also speaks to their different culture. Their culture was all about not just exploration, but exploration for the goal of taking over and, you know, multiplying to the point where now here is all of our people are in all of these places and we've run all of the things. And so <clears throat> because they took that approach and essentially showed up with bigger, bigger, more violent, more able, able to kill weapons, they became, you know, a military superpower. And what's what happened is that they started to take that military superiority so that where they, you know, kind of showed up and excelled militarily, they took that to mean that they were also intellectually superior. And so what they began to do was they begin to really lean into the whole science of white supremacy and how, you know, there are different races. And it was like the races were identified by their <clears throat> level of civilization. So you had the black race, which were the least civilized. You had the brown 
race who were kind of like um, native. So they weren't people from the continent of Africa. They were the native folks, um, even probably some of the now white folks. I don't know if like Jewish, Polish people, if they were considered brown or if they were kind of like one up from brown, but they were, you know, most civilized to least civilized. And of course, of course, the most civilized were the white people because they were the ones creating the yardstick. So it's like you want me to, you are holding me up to a standard that's based on you, but I'm not you. I don't look like you. I don't live like you. I don't think like you. So I am thereby, thereby going to be inferior to you because you are the yardstick. And so here's here we are. And they continue to push that um, even through kind of like the theory of evolution, Darwin. And one of the things that came out of that, so there was a couple of quotes that I wrote, but one of the, one of the quotes um, or one of the things that kind of came out of just this push toward progress um, and progress as defined by the Europeans because other, you know, other empires, cultures, groups of people define progress a little bit differently. But the way that these particular these particular Europeans define progress was by, um, I guess, early eminent domain. So like how much can we take over? How much land can we take and make our own? And genocide this is directly from the documentary genocide began to be regarded as the inevitable byproduct of progress so it's almost like if we want to be better and do better and push ourselves forward into all these different revolutions industrial technological etc then we're gonna have to kill some uh, people and by people i mean full communities of people we're just gonna have to get rid of them and the idea um, of things going extinct that was a new concept so when that idea first came up where it was like things that um, you know that do exist can all of a sudden be out of existence people were horrified at the thought of that because where they were in the 1800s where they were at that time was you know, God created the world and the way that the God created the world is the way that the world still is to this day. So there aren't species that are going extinct. Like nothing's going, nothing's going anywhere, but also nothing new is coming. Um, and so when, you know, someone, um, when a scientist kind of brought the idea of, well, hey, actually, there's some species that used to be around here that are no longer around based on what they found in their research. People were at first, of course, horrified because they're like, what do you mean? There's species that can go away. You mean God's creation is just not perfect and exist in this stasis. And then they took that concept and used it in their favor. And so they realized when they came to the conclusion based on their own internal, like no, no real proof, just based on what they thought. They, real, they came to the conclusion, their own selves, that they were the superior race of humans and that in order for, you know, the human race to be, to progress and to continue to grow and thrive, that the lesser inferior races of human would either need to be, you know, gotten rid of or exterminated as the title of the whole documentary says, or they just will kind of die out naturally. But in a lot of instances, they pushed it along. Um, but that was, you know, kind of the cost of doing business. I got to figure quote that because that's a weighted thing to say, but that's essentially what it was. And it's very interesting how you know, when you have people that sit in a room with themselves and talk about what needs to be done as it relates to people that are not them, but who also are not in the room, how that is dangerous and what can happen when those kinds of things take place. And so one of the other quotes that I wrote down from the um, documentary was by Herbert Spencer. And he said, 
Imperialism has served civilization by clearing the inferior races from the earth. So that's how, when, when we talk about imperialism and colonialism, and to some people, when you say that, they might take it as, you know, a bad thing. But this is like a something that they kind of hung their hats on. Like, this is a thing that they were like, we are clearing the earth for progress. And when you position your bigotry as if it is for the greater good, you, you almost don't need to tell people to do horrible things to other people because you've already given them a sound reasoning and excuse for why what they're doing makes sense is okay and is actually really helping the larger state of humanity even when it's not and so in seeing that something that came to mind for me after watching that was like wow you set out to rid the earth of people like me from you know centuries ago and you have been unable to do so and so when some of these people are so mad and angry and so venomous and vicious, it's like, oh, because you thought that you were supposed to be smarter, better, faster, pure than me, which means that you deserve to be here and I don't. And when you start thinking about white supremacy from that level, it makes a lot of things kind of clear. Also, what it does is I hope, and for me for sure, but hopefully for you watching this, is takes the takes the weight off of you for feeling like if I just show white people that I'm a good person, I just show them I could be as smart as, as fast as, as good as, as whatever as they are or as they tell me I need to be to be considered worthy you never can because they it is baked into their cultural upbringing and by culture that means not just what happens in school and you know in in holiday observations and because oftentimes people think culture they think like broad you know what can happen like with large groups of people but culture is built in the home so if you live in a home and oftentimes that's even more of more kind of steeped, you're more steeped in your culture, in your house, because those are people you talk to day in and day out. You exist with day in and day out from your through your formative years, even well into adulthood, because even though you might leave your parents home and you don't live with them anymore, that doesn't mean you're not still having conversation with them. This is also why when we say things like just because something happened, you know, hundreds of years ago, why can't you just get over it as if it's a snapshot in time, as if it's like it happened at that time. And then once it was over, it, oh, it was over. That's not true because you are still being raised with the values of those people from that time who were doing that terrible thing to other people. And so those types of values is why when people say things like, you know, I'm proud to be, to carry this name. I'm proud to, you know, there's shirts that are like, we are our ancestors' greatest dreams. And, you know, my family lineage is everything to me. That's not just the, the name or the representation. That's also your familial culture. And so you can't, you can't tell me, especially after having this historical context placed on it, that something that happened 400 years ago is now null and void because the thing that was happening stopped happening. Because the people that made that thing happen made that thing continue and supported it being in existence just because it's no longer publicly sanctioned doesn't mean that those values and beliefs aren't still guiding the creation of families and familial culture. And so 
just by looking at that and just kind of seeing, oh, these beliefs and these execution of those beliefs are what were used to create all of this that we live in now. And when people say things like white supremacy is baked into the institutions, that's because it is. Not even just in the words that are used, because the words, things like all white men, that's like written in all of these kind of governing documents that are used as the foundation of our society. Um, definitely in the United States and the US for sure. Um, that's baked in. Like that, but also the people who wrote those words and had the beliefs that they had to write those words and, sp and specify in that way because language is power and language has value. Then those same people, they then went home to raise their children who took those same values to raise their children, to raise their children. And here we are today. So it'll be very interesting to see how everything is wrapped up in episode four because they're going to bring it all back to center. Now, something else I wanted to point out that I thought was very interesting um, for various reasons, <laughs> but the word genocide is really new. I thought that it wasn't just because genocides in and of themselves have been happening, you know, for centuries um, because it's one of the, it's a tactic for taking over a particular land. If you get rid of um, all of the people who are all, you know, one particular group of people just so that you could make yourself the supreme people. And so you kind of pick something about another group that makes you different and then proceed to get rid of any of the people who exhibit that difference. That's essentially a genocide. But I didn't even know this. Um, Raphael Lemkin in 1943 coined the term genocide and he kind of um, mixed a um, two words, one geno meaning um, group, like cultural group, group of people, um, and side meaning to kill. Um, I think one of them is Latin. I'm terrible at etymology and so I won't even pretend that that is me. I will, I will definitely share a link <laughs> down below to just kind of talks about the that word and was creating and the reason why he you know came up with that word is because he was like when you go out and kill like why when people go out and kill a bunch of people that that's deemed a necessary part of war but when you kill one person you go to jail like he was just kind of like uh the math isn't mathing so he was working to make the make genocide an actual crime and um he has a whole um the the genocide convention that he kind of talked about and was studying and it was at that time it was a crime without a name like he was like this is a crime when you kill a bunch of people that's a crime but <laughs> but what do we call it so that is again another just indicator of how language is powerful and, and important because if you don't have a name for it, then people can pretend it doesn't exist or they can pretend it's not as bad or as important or as you know impactful as it is. When you give a name to it, then you can call it out and point out. And then once you've named it, now you can define it. Now you can identify it. Now you can address it. If it doesn't have that, then ultimately it just is a thing that exists, but it does, there's nothing you can wrap your, you can't really wrap things around it uh, because you don't have a way to talk about it to even try to get rid of it. And so the importance of language and being able to define things, this has always been valuable. And just from, um, you know, the work that Raphael Lemkin did with coining the term genocide and then proceeded to make a list of the world genocides was calling a thing a thing to to, to put in the young Levin sense spin on it. You this is what it is. This is what I'm calling it. And now that I've just now that I've identified what it is, now I can outline when it's happened. That is powerful. And so 
But I thought that was very interesting that that happened in 1943. That's recent. Like, uh, there are people that are still alive, well, and thriving who were born in 43. Like, that's not 100 years ago. That's not, you know, there are people still alive and well who were born at that time. There are people that is one generation away from people who were born at that time. Like, just, just thinking about that, that was like, that kind of was mind blowing to me. But another thing um, that was mentioned was, you know how you would hear these stories. I hear this a lot, especially when talking to black people about like their grandparents, their, the elders um, who might have lived through Jim Crow or um, lived through, well, who might have, who lived through Jim Crow, who lived through, if you were, um, if you're old enough, you might have um, relatives who were connected to, to slavery times where like they might not have been enslaved, but like their mother or father or was enslaved or they knew people who were enslaved and how those people do not talk about that time period. Cause one, it's traumatic because that's traumatic, but also because it's painful and they don't want to remember that time because some in some instances like keeping talking about it makes it gives it more value we want to forget that we dealt with that and want to focus on what we experiencing now and our success and how we're growing and the positive but by not talking about it you are not acknowledging it you're not giving language and weight to it and then you are allowing your part of the story to not be told because there are people who are talking about it. And when they talk about it, their perspective is skewed towards them. It's, you know, that whole thing. It's like you have her, his side, her side, or you have side one of the story, side two of the story. Then you have the actual story. Sometimes all three of them work well together, but depending on the interest of the person who's telling the story, it may or may not. And um, I thought that was also very powerful and interesting because it, it always makes me sad when I hear about people who've experienced these things in history that we need to know about. And we don't need to know about them as a broad construct. We need to know about them practically day-to-day -day experience and how they don't want to talk about them because they don't want to remember the hard things or don't want to talk about the bad times. And I get that because trauma is real. You know, post-traumatic stress from life especially life as a person of a certain race is real but it's just like we have to I'm glad now we're starting to talk about it and so we can get this context and understand what it is that happened in real terms and not in high level you know story time I'm painting myself as the positive approach so what did you think about episode three? Um, I would love your thoughts. Like I say, every time I, I make these videos, there's so much chock full of information that I did not talk about everything. Um, it's impossible to do so effectively, but I would love to hear, you know, what, what are some things that stood out for you? What some things kind of gave you like a light bulb moment or a moment of clarity or just kind of a moment of, wow, that's messed up and what can I do to fix it? Or even just, wow, that's messed up. Sometimes that's, you have to start there. But what were your thoughts? Um, I will be back to talk about episode four. I'm very excited to look at that one. I want to see how he ties it all together. And um, I'm also excited to chat with you in the comments. So I um, look forward to the next time that we can talk again about episode four of Exterminate All the Brutes. Bye.